Hi, the following is a discussion with Lance Armstrong, one of the most well-known athletes of our times. And we got to discuss with him about training, nutrition, and wearables. I'm Kiriakos, founder and CEO of Terra, and started this podcast with my co-founder, Ralph, to speak about, speak about wearables, fitness, and health. Terra is an API that makes it easy for apps to connect to wearables. Um, you know, it's funny, I got a question today on our, we're doing these uh, weekly Zwift group rides and, and I do a, while I'm doing it, I also do a Discord channel where people can at basically ask anything. One of the people today asked, you know, I think <clears throat> somebody who clearly follows the sport sees how much, um, you know, how much technology has evolved since we raced. And they, and somebody on the Discord channel today asked, what one piece of technology would we want to have back then that, that, that all of these guys and gals have now? Um, it was a great question. Never, never, I've never been asked that question, but it's in line with what we're going to talk about today. So, so, so many different changes. I mean, we came from a time, well, I mean, to go all the way back, you know, when I started racing, Polar had not come out with a heart rate monitor yet. Think about that. <clears throat> and then they, the first wearable, by the way. Yeah, my first one as well. And they were about the size of a of a small car. I mean, they were huge. Oh wow. Um and, and then of course things, you know, evolved. And then really the big um you know, the, the biggest change or the biggest um advancement was was the power meter. I mean when when SRM came out with the power meter, um that that changed every that changed training, racing, recovery, changed everything. And of course now it's just continuing to evolve with everything from the aura ring or whoop band to uh, all the CGMs out there. Um, these guys they, they and, and 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 I think the connection also when we raced, you know, we we were paid to to train and race and but it was sort of our responsibility. Like they said, okay do well in the races, like show up and be ready. We're like, okay, we did whatever we wanted. Um, I think now the connection between the athlete and the team and the trainer and all of the training staff is much, I think they basically, they don't live with them, but they follow everything, right? So there's no, and they're probably for most of them dictating the training programs. So their ability to analyze and truly cover these athletes is totally different. Lance, before, before we go into that, this is one of our discussion uh, topics, but be before we uh, dive deeper into this, we wanted to have a brief introduction from you in terms of what gave you the motivation to start? How, tell us more about how you started when you were young. You know, I started, I mean, a lot like you, Ralph. I'm, I, I, my first serious sport was swimming. So I, I as a young kid in Texas, you know, <clears throat> Texas, the big five sports are actually – only the big four because hockey wasn't a uh, wasn't very uh, popular, but um, football, baseball, basketball. Um, so I tried all those sports and was just just not very good. I, my coordination is not great. I, I, I like to joke that I have two left feet, um, and I just I couldn't. I didn't want to play those anymore. My mom said, "Well, you have to you have to do." She literally said, "You have to play one sport." I had a couple friends on the swim team. But I'd never, you know, I'd never done the swim team. You know, I didn't, I could kind of dog paddle. And I said, well, I'll, maybe I'll try to join the swim team. And this is when I was right around 11 or 12, which is late for swimming. A lot of swimmers, you know, the greats of, of, of our time started when they were four or five, six years old. Seriously. And so I, I was, I was, you know, as you know, they, the, the faster you are, the, the further right down the pool you go lane one is the fastest people maybe it gets broken up a little more as we get older and and, and it's a little more specific but I started as a 12 year old kid swimming with six-year-olds and I thought man I don't know if I can do this it was totally embarrassing and then it it I stuck with it though and I'm and I'm so glad that I did it's still to this day my favorite sport um and in a sport that if if some superpower of the world said, Lance, you can only do one sport for the rest of your life. It would be swimming. And so 
I moved up, you know, started swimming with the seven-year-olds and then the eight-year-olds and then finally moved my way up. And then by the time I was 15, um, I was third in the state of Texas in the 1500. I was a, I was a distance freestyler. Um, but that's really, and then of course, from uh, at that point, then I thought oh, I'll run, I'll run track and cross country in high school. So then I had two of the three sports of the triathlon. The bike was the last one to come. And I saw an ad for a kid's triathlon uh, called Iron Kids. I thought, well, I'm already doing two of these three sports. Maybe I'll try to find a bike and, and do do the triathlon. Anyways, got a bike, entered the race, and won, won my first triathlon. And then, of course, uh, turned pro really less than a year after that, which is kind of wild to think about. At what, uh, at what age were you then? Um, I was almost, when I turned pro, I was almost 16. So I was still 15 years old. And I just did that on a whim. Of course, I grew up in Dallas, Texas. There was at the time, the largest triathlon in the world participation wise was in Dallas it was called president's triathlon and they had a big pro event too. So I, uh, you know, a guy I trained was like, you should, you should, uh, sign up as a pro. <laughs> and I was just crazy enough. I was like, all right, fuck it. <clears throat> I'll try that. Come out of the water with the lead group. Um, come off the bike second with Mark Allen. And then I think ended up, you know, still ended up top 10. I couldn't run with those, with those guys, those older guys. But I thought, wow. And then continued, you know, doing those for years and years. Um, loved it. Traveled all around. Made a little money. Made more money than my buddies were making working down at McDonald's. Had some sponsorship prize money it was great was there uh, any specific turning point when you uh, thought you could compete at a high level if you remember in tries or in cycling in cycling um you know i, I turned pro uh, after the olympic games in barcelona so in 1992 i went and did my first professional cycling race a week, just a week after the Barcelona games, uh, also in Spain over in San Sebastian, the other side of the country. And, uh, it was a San Sebastian classic and I got dead last last. Now, a lot of people, the weather turned, it was awful. Half the field dropped out, but of the people that finished, I got last place. So that was certainly a point where I thought, Oh no, I probably can't do this. And, um, as, as happens in cycling, then I just, you know, the very next week we had a small stage race in, in, uh, in Galicia went over there and, uh, won one of the stages. So three days prior, three or four days prior, get last. I'm thinking, shit, I made a, I should just go home three days later, win my first pro event, um, then go to Zurich for the world cup which is the next World Cup after the World Cup that I got last in. And I get second in Zurich. And, and I was like, okay, that's better. I, 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 think I, I think I can do it. But really, 93 was my, that, 1993 was my first full-time year as a pro. Um, and, and, you know, of course, uh, won a stage in the Tour, won the World Championships. Um, pr probably that, you know. It's, it's hard to go back and figure out which one was a, was a light bulb moment for me, but um, hard to argue against the very first win in, in, at the Tour of Galicia, which is uh, fond memories. I actually won it. The funny thing, you know, I'm not, I don't have, as I have two left feet, I don't have a ton of fast twitch muscle. I'm much more slow twitch, much more. I actually won a field sprint. In, at that race for my first pro win. And then, of course, Zurich, the World Cup that I got second in, very, very difficult, very, very hilly. Um, so more my style. But, uh, and was beat by the great Vacheslav Ekimov, which was uh, one of the greatest Russian riders of all time. Ended up being on Postal with us and, and a key member of, uh, of all those victories. Lance, in, in those days, um... At the beginning, how much were you actually optimizing? Were you op optimizing your nutrition uh, or your sleep and training? No, no, totally yeah. no, no. And, and what you know, to put it in perspective, I was turned pro at 21 years old, um, but not not not. 
Uh, no, not only was I not doing it, there wasn't a lot of outside of waking up in the morning and saying, oh, I felt like I got a good night's sleep. That was, that was how we were tracking sleep at that time. Um, nutrition wise, not very much. I mean, the, the name of the game is, is to be as light as possible, yet as strong as possible. So in a funny way, like, you know, for most of my career, since there wasn't a ton of innovation or a ton of things to, to help us along, one of the most important, if not the most important thing, was the scale that sat on the bathroom floor. Like you had to, we, we were married to that scale. And so, um, and the scale never lies, right? There's a lot of things out there that, not that they lie, but they, um, maybe not that accurate or, or inconsistent. And the scale never lies. What's the, you know very much that the, the, the psychology plays a very uh, big role in the athlete's mind before going to competition. How, how was it in terms of psychological preparation? Again, uh, in the early days, right? So yeah, before, sure. No, it was, you... right. And I, I, I never, my answer for early days or latter days is going to be the same. I was always extremely self-motivated. Um, I never struggled with, with motivation or inspiration to, to go out on a six hour training ride in the rain. And I never struggled to motivate myself for the races. What was the mindset really? Uh, where are you thinking that, um, I'm the best, I'm going to win. Uh, was it, was it about you? Was it about, I just want to beat that other competitor? How, how was it? No, it was about it was about beating the field. Um, I could I could compete against myself in training or in testing, um, but you're paid not to do that. You're paid to go out and beat two hundred other guys. Um, but yes, the mindset was I'll, I'll never forget. We we hired a really fabulous Spanish rider, um, Chechu Rubiera, and I think he came on the team and. His first year was probably 2001, so I had won 99-2000, so two in a row, going for the third. And we were at a training camp in in, uh, in January, and it was his first time with the team. And we were just talking on a, on a ride one day, and I said, I said, uh, I said, I, I, I guarantee you I'm going to win the tour. And Chechu, who's the sweetest guy, very, very bright as well, I'll never forget, he looked at me like, Nobody in the world guarantees you're going to win a three-week tour. Too many things can go wrong. Uh, somebody can be better. I mean, you name it. <clears throat> but I was 100% sure. I looked at him. I said, no, it, it, I guarantee it. He about fell off his bike. It was amazing. <laughs> and, 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 and uh, you know, fortunately, I was able to back it up. We still laugh about it. In, in, in the question of nutrition earlier, do you know uh, what, what, what the others were doing? Were people actually optimizing their nutrition and training in the early days? Or was it more of a, um, more, more of a flu thing? I, th I think it was, it was, it was uh, it, well, first of all, it's hard to say because cycling, especially then, and I think even holds true today i mean unless a rider switches teams and shares with the new team what <clears throat> what methods or technology was going on in his previous team you just don't hear a lot and so you would just be guessing but uh um hard to say and also hard also another important thing to keep in mind is now in cycling when when you Obviously, at home, you can control your nutrition, right? You go to the grocery store, you cook your meal, um, you're in complete control. Now, also, when they go to the races, they have a team chef, so everything is controlled. Back then, and we're, again, we're going back, gosh, 30 years. You know, we were staying in hotels. We ate what the hotel brought to the table. You, you couldn't say, I mean, in 1993 or four or whatever year, if they brought something, you say, excuse me, I'm, I'm, I'm plant-based or I'm keto. Could you take it back and bring, they would have, 
they would have thrown it on the floor and walked away. Like they, there was no customizing. It, it was very old school. And then, um, when, when did you actually, uh, when did you actually start, uh, in, in the training kind of things, when did you actually start optimizing training and, and, w- and what was the plan really? So the, 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 Good question. So I, I, and this, you know, a lot of this is, is, and I want, I want to make sure we, for, for the sake of this conversation and, and out of respect for you guys and out of respect for the audience, this needs to be a completely transparent conversation. Um, so, you know, I, I, I synced up with, uh, Dr. McKelly Ferrari in really in 96. And then of course I was diagnosed later that year and, and, um, sort of resumed working with him again in 1998 when I came back, um, that, that was, you know, in a, but especially, I mean, we were optimized sort of in 1996 in 98, 99, that's where, I mean, he so closely followed me and, and despite all of the controversy and all of the new, you know, all of the stuff that's out there, the man is, is brilliant. I mean, he does know training and physiology better than anybody on the planet. I'm, I'm pretty sure about that. And so it was, it was at that point, very optimized. We spent a ton of time together, um, as op- I should say, it's, it was as optimized as we could be with the technology at hand. So, uh, everything power-based, obviously a huge emphasis on the weight, um, a lot of testing. So lactate, just, uh, I guess almost traditional lactate testing. Followed up like, by some. How did you test for lactate, though? So just with a, a finger prick, just the the, the small mobile uh, unit. So the test that we uh, we used forever was the one kilometer test. So it's it very basic, you know. So you you find essentially find a one kilometer climb that averages ten percent. And of course, in Europe, those are everywhere, right? There's a lot of climbs, um, and we would start at a very low level of watts. So, I mean, at the tour time, my threshold was 500 watts. So, uh, we'd start at 250 and we'd bump it to 275, but every time he would be standing at the, at the finish or at the, you know, the end of the kilometer and, and take a lactate sample. And you would obviously watch it creep up, but we would go up in 25 watt increments until, you know, we generally used four millimoles as, as lactate threshold. Um, which I think uh, most people either uh, did then or, or maybe still do now. Um, and but but the the point is we did it all the time. We started in January. We would do it, you know, two or three times a month. This these series of tests, and then once you sort of figure out what what your lactate threshold was, of course, in January it's a lot lower than July. Then you would follow that up with some thirty minute effort at that prescribed lactate level and see if you could maintain it almost like a a confirmation but um yeah yeah fun stuff in my you know if the thing i loved about that testing and and uh and just if i had to look at you always look at your situation what made me better than you know most of the other guys right What, what was it the body was it the mind was it you know, was it the length of the femur? I mean, it sounds funny to say, but like a long femur is a long lever. That is better for cycling, fact. Um, but the one thing that I think anybody that was close to the to the numbers uh, would say is, I just had a really unique ability to buffer lactic acid. So guys, would you'd see lactic acid numbers on some guys that were in the double digits. I've never seen double digits. And furthermore, my ability to clear the, the lactic acid, because keep in mind, a race, a bike race with 200 guys, isn't, it's not a marathon. It's not a steady state effort. This is a dynamic, fluid organism. So I am at the mercy of all of these other guys. If they're attacking and I have to cover the move, lactate's going to go up. And then you have to recover while the race is still going on. So I just had this ability to, uh, to get back down below four millimoles, maybe better than the others. Is that, I think I heard something, uh, something about you similar from uh, Joe Rogan's podcast, and he was referring to this. 
Um, I think today there are some devices that actually measure um, lactate. H have you came across them? So I know, look, I mean, I think the, the popularity of the CGM space has really inspired a lot of people to, to figure out. And, and look, <clears throat> the two big players there, Abbott and Dexcom, are, are miles ahead of anybody else. Right? They have the budget, they have the technology, they have the experience, um, they have the bandwidth, the manpower, all of it. But the CGM popularity has inspired people to say, well, okay, if we can measure glucose, why wouldn't we be able to measure lactate? And why wouldn't we be able to measure hydration, ketones, all of these things, right? So uh, I, my hunch is that, yes, those devices are being developed and it'll be, you know, be fascinating. I don't know that, um, I mean, as you guys probably are well aware, the UCI, so the International Federation for Cycling, uh, has banned the use of, of the CGMs in races. Um, I'm sure the, the athletes, as they should, are probably training with them to try to perfect uh, nutrition on the bike. But um, it, it will, it, you know, it, as cool as it sounds, it, it, you know, athletes in the future will have some sort of a dashboard, which you guys know the space better than almost anybody. Um, now that leads to the question of, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Right. Does that, I mean, cycling is very traditional when race radios were invented, you know, people, oh, this is terrible. The riders are not thinking for themselves. They're not, they, they can't determine their own tactics. They're being told what to do. They're like robots. This is boring. Um, <clears throat> so it, it, you'll hear more and more about that, but um, they will be able to perfectly um, sort of pace themselves. If you had that dashboard with hydration, lactate, glucose, keto, all of these things. Hard to make a mistake. It's that uh, Abbott, by the way, came out the other day and they announced uh, all of those sensors. And they're like, uh, by the next year, you're going to have lactate one, uh, the glucose they already have. And they have a lot of uh, biomarkers that they are testing. But but here's the, the whole point. It's um, you're probably the greatest athlete in this space. But by what you're saying in the early days, you weren't doing so much optimization. Whereas think about the next 10 years, uh, how this space is going to change by so much optimization. So much, yeah. Well, we, we yeah, you're right, but we didn't because it wasn't available. I mean, I, I, I don't, I think in any sport, I mean, you could look at American football, right? How did they train, right? They went into the weight room, they did bench press, they did some squats, they did some curls. If, if think about going back in the early nineties into American football, you go into the weight room of the, of the Dallas Cowboys and you say, okay, guys. And again, 30 years ago, you say, hey, guys, we're going to, I want I want to talk about it. And I want us to think about flexibility and mobility. They would have laughed you out of there. They said, no, we're doing bench press. So it, the, the, the mindset, even, I mean, obviously technology has evolved immensely, but the mindset has as well. When, when you remember the, the, the first days when uh, the first wearables came to market, let's say Polar, for example, was it? Can, can you tell us more about it? Did you use it? Uh, was it uh, was it was it useful? Was it something that you were thinking of uh, using its insights to optimize? Yeah. So in, in we did use it, fortunately, because in in I joined uh, Team Motorola in '92, and we were actually sponsored by Polar. So yeah, we, we, we were some, one of the lucky ones. We, we had access to whatever we wanted, <clears throat> but we definitely not, not, I mean, I should preface this, a lot of this. And even when the power meter came along and revolutionized training, we didn't use it in races. So now they race with it. They watch their power constantly in the race. We would train with it. The early iteration of the SRM was very heavy, very bulky. It, the, the, so many things were different about the crank, the Q factor, for example. So the actual width of the crank, not to mention we had a, you know, like every team, you have a, a component manufacturer who sponsors the team. So they want you exclusively on their equipment. So we would use, you know, early days, the heart rate monitor, just in training, not in the races, early days, the power meter and training, not in the races. Okay. And, and it's like, it's, 
it's very interesting because if you now use a power meter constantly uh, versus before, before it was much more based on feeling, uh, much more based on how you trained. Now it's actually you just follow uh, the power. Exactly. So you just follow the power meter. It's, it's just so different. Go watch a go watch a pro bike race now. Watch how much they look at their at their head unit. They're not looking at what time of day it is or how fast they're going uphill because they're not. You know, they're they are on, they are just constantly monitoring power. They know um, they know their limits and they know what at what point they go uh, above threshold. And so and that's you know and and that is the argument right that um, that sort of a traditionalist would say oh. Now the coach tells them in the radio what to do. Now they just stare at their power meter. And this is, you know, this is my point I was saying earlier where the traditionalist thinks it's too robotic and it's just not as, as artsy as it, you know, cycling is a very, um, it is a very, very traditional sport. I think some of that has faded, but, uh, you know, you still have those purists out there. It, it depends what, like, uh, go ahead, Skips. Yeah, with uh, with that polar HRM uh, that you first uh, used, what did you actually do with it? So you get the data, you get the metrics. I guess was it like they had those devices? It wasn't connected to a phone. So probably was it yep. through the first watch they had, or was it like the the screens they initially had? And what, it was a, how it was it, it was a watch, and okay. uh, and it was like I said earlier, it was big, but we would we would. Uh, uh, you, you, I mean, it, 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 you, no matter what, it, guys had all different ways to attach it to the handlebars. You know, you could take a, a headband and wrap it around a few times and it would fit on the on the handlebar. I mean, this is so primitive, but that's exactly what they did. But, but nobody was inputting zones or, you know, you would just look at, at where your heart rate was. And over time, you start to learn like what affects my heart rate just on a very, very basic level. Right. So now I'm sitting here in Aspen at 8,000 feet. I know that my heart rate is going to be completely different for a similar effort at sea level. It's just, that's, that's, we all know that now, but those days you were just starting to learn these things. And if you felt like you were getting into the season and getting in better shape, you would see the heart rate come down quicker. You're like, Oh, I'm getting in better shape. Um, but not, and then obviously looking at Max. I mean, I've, I've, um, I've seen some crazy. Of course, it helps when you're in your 20s and not in your 50s. Um, but I've seen 209. Uh, I've done a time trial for an hour above 200 the whole time. Oh wow! One hour, and I, I, that actually. So that 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 tour 2000, I did wear so no power meter on the bike, but I did wear a heart rate monitor for the time trials. So the final TT in 2000, I came down the start ramp. Your heart rate's already high because you're on the start ramp. You're, you're excited and you're nervous and all these things. And I came down the ramp and it was almost immediately 190. After a K, it, it hit 200 and it never dropped below 200 for one hour. Wow. <laughs> I know. I, I just use it to go to the gym now and I rarely hit 200 like for a for a for for a second not, yeah. not an hour <laughs> and i was and you would think you know for for 200 beats a minute over an hour you you, you would you know be falling up. but i i was in I, and i was i remember looking down going all right let's go like i was in such a zone it, it was obviously it's a time trial you have to go as hard as possible but it's an effort that you know you can sustain just based on your experience for one hour and yeah, it was wild. Like when I tell people that story and even when I hear myself tell that story now, I'm like, geez, that's insane. When, when you think back in the days, Lance, it's, uh, what, what could have made a big difference in terms of tech solutions that would uh, have made it better for you? Well, that's to that, to the person that asked the, the question on the discord this morning. Um, I mean, I think of, uh, and by the way, they're still using crank-based power meters. Um, and, you know, again, full disclosure, I mean, obviously we're large investors in Aura. I mean, the Aura ring, just just with its accuracy, its simplicity, um, its consistency, like that, that would make a massive... I don't understand why every professional athlete is not wearing 
some form of the, it doesn't have to be a, an aura ring. Obviously we're biased, but either aura or whoop, um, incredibly important. I do think also the CGM stuff would have been really fascinating just to I think people's bodies react uh, to a lot of things differently, but obviously nutrition, stress, the weather, all these things. So it, it would have been really fascinating to play around in that space as well. That, that's from a, from a hardware perspective. So what, when you think about all those wearables that are being launched in the market, now when you think about it from a software perspective, what sort of uh, solution do you think would have made a big difference in terms of being built on top of the hardware to get you up to another level? Oh, God, that's a good question. Strava doesn't count. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I'd have to think about that one. I'd have to think about that. Um, I am a big, uh, as most people know, I am a big fan of Strava. In, in just in your previous one, like what specifically from Aura do you like? Is it the heart rate variability or is it that you can see your deep sleep levels, for example? Uh, well, and I also like to see, um, uh, and I think it's been obviously amplified with, with COVID, but up core temp is um, really important. And just resting heart rate. You know, I know, you know, uh, in so many, obviously, so many things affect that. And if you're a finely tuned professional athlete, you're taking away a lot of these variables. But when you're not, when you're just a 50 year old guy who trains part time and drinks red wine at dinner and, and, you know, doesn't, you know, really care what he eats, um, you notice a big difference. So I, 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 I you know, HRV, I, I would go crazy if I, if I stared at my HRV every morning, I just don't, but I do like, checking my, my core temp and, and just resting heart rate. Well, as you know, I'm and I would, I'm the, the, the only other thing I would add to that is, and you know, half the world sleeps well, the other half sleeps like shit. And so I've, I'm of that half that's been blessed with an ability to sleep. Like I see a pillow and I go to sleep. So when it comes to really getting into sleep cycles and, and, and movement, um, like my, my average latency on the aura rings about three or four minutes. I, oh, I, I just, yeah, I just fall asleep immediately. And my wife, who I obviously sleep next to her every night, she's a terrible sleeper. So she's over there just pissed off at me. You know, the, um, um, I usually measure, it's like I'm just wearing a Garmin device and I'm measuring my data for like five years or something. And I had COVID about a year ago. Mm-hmm. And my usual, like my resting heart rate, as you mentioned, resting heart rate, my usual resting is around 50. I had COVID and for six months after COVID, yeah. my resting heart rate was 58, 58, huh. 59. And it went back to normal after like month seven or something. Wow. Yeah, I think, you know, I, 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 I was fortunate to make it two years without getting COVID. And I thought I had all these things How did figured you manage out to do that? i don't know I, I i don't know i had i had a lot of uh, things that i dreamed up my blood type you know i'm i'm, I'm invincible out of some bullshit but we ended up getting it finally in early december um and we were uh, uh, and when they test here in aspen they send it off to the state and then like two weeks later they called us so we were early cases of omicron but i think you know as this thing is let's call it matured over time and, and morphed and, and done what it's done. Um, it seems like, I mean, I, I was sick for a day for one day. I felt really bad and then I really was fine and I haven't noticed any difference. Of course I had a huge spike in core temp on the ring, the aura ring, um, but no lasting effects. I, I did. I will say I did try to take it easy for several weeks afterwards. So I would go to the gym, light gym work, no aerobic and, and especially no anaerobic activity. Just talked to too many people that thought there was da enough data out there that, that showed some sort of long-term effects, which I don't want. And so, um, yeah, yeah. I don't, I, I don't know how we avoided it for so long, but when we finally got it, it kind of came and went. And then in your, in the cycling that you do now, do you actually measure the same? 
uh, like before before COVID? It's like if you measure your power, if you measure your heart rate, is it the same? So here's the thing. So I I never ride with a power meter and I never ride with a heart rate monitor, ever. Oh, okay. I, I am purely a recreational cyclist now. Mm. Yeah. I know, I know that you guys are like, oh, the bad answer, bad answer. <laughs> I, I, I still go hard. You know, if I'm out with, with buddies that are a lot weaker than me, I'll, we'll just chill. But I have a lot of guys around here that love to hammer and we will go out and go as hard as we possibly can. And I, and I just consider that I'm like, okay, great. That was a great day. But I'm, I can't tell you the last time I, I had a, um, an SRM on my bike. Yeah, Go, going back to Kiriakou's point, I think it's uh, it's it's super interesting to see like when when you measure uh, when when you uh, when you got COVID, Kiriakou's, and uh, the change in your resting heart rate was a determination of if with and that's that's the whole point of what we actually are building with Terra is the ability to have this infrastructure where when if there are so many use cases where you can get the um, ability to detect. Uh, cases like COVID or other diseases using devices that are um, that could be used in many ways, and this is like this is one element of the use case uh, of the resting heart rate uh, for the case of COVID. So, right. it's, well, are there any use cases that you can think of, Lance? Um, I mean, outside of uh, of and and I think Aura really benefited in like in a in a sadistic way they they did benefit from the pandemic right that this was you know people noticing this tremendous spike i mean we all have fluctuation in our in our core temp but tremendous differences that that were alerting people you know either of a, a impending a diagnosis or whatever so that that's i mean i think that's the best and and i should give a shout out to whoop i mean obviously they they can they can measure these things as well I mean, back to the back, back to this point. It's um, it's something we 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 were always saying, right? Uh, if you have an API that makes it super easy for apps to connect to all the wearable data, mm -hmm. you can really build any solution. Uh, one of it is the example of COVID. So, if obviously if I have COVID and my resting heart rate is increased, and also my respiration is higher, and my pulse oxidation is higher, this is a pattern change. Uh, and if you have people with like five years of data, this is a big pattern change for an app to come and build on top of it, right? Mm -hmm. And then it's like, it's not only COVID, it's, we can speak for hours on what type of uh, customers, uh, what type of apps are building on top of Terra, but it's like, think like a sleep mattress company uh, aggregating your, uh, your deep sleep levels and then optimizing the temperature of the bed in order to create better recommendations and optimize your sleep or um, food delivery. It's like, think about like food delivery. So it's like you, you are an athlete, uh, you do all your activities, you check your calories, but at the same time you get the full food delivery uh, to your house, the actual nutrients you need to eat, right? Um, yeah, and amazing. This is from, from the consumer and then you go to the telemedicine space uh, and a doctor can see your heart rate they can see your respiration, they can see, uh, it's like real time data and historical data continuously. So it's literally right. changing the way that, uh, that this works. And obviously the, all the apps that are building on top of the CGMs, uh, solutions for nutrition and sleep and fitness and all that. So, well, it's, it's, it's not dissimilar from what we talked about earlier. I mean, it, that's, you know, when I was talking about the difference between a professional cyclist or any professional athlete today versus 30 years ago. And now how these guys and gals are, are constantly being monitored by paid staff, paid doctors, paid trainers, paid physios, everything. So what you just laid out is a democratization of that. So you're taking that from the tip of the spear, which you would expect that the best athletes in the world would have, but you, you just let it trickle all the way down through the marathon field, the peloton, whatever it is, and you that then as you lay it out, and you know whether we're a month away or ten years away, I don't know, but you are making that accessible for the everyday warrior. Yeah, and it's like when Apple came to the game and they made they made it more of a 
consumer play uh, and everybody's just buying wearables today uh, and they're measuring the data and they're getting more interested. It's like you can see solutions like, think like Spotify, Spotify using your uh, heart rate to create song recommendations. Right. Or like your Netflix to create, uh, to take your HRV, measure your stress and create movie recommendations. So it, it moves not inside the, not only inside of the athletes, but it's much more of a consumer uh, oriented uh, solution as well. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Speaking about this, um, Lance, so we know that uh, now with your, uh, with your fund Next Ventures, uh, which we are fortunate enough to uh, uh, raise investment from you, what's the, how, when you think about um, the past investments that you made, what's, can you give us a few examples that, of companies that you're excited about and what's the future like in this space? Yeah, I think it's, um, obviously, you, you, and, and I, you know, in the zone of full transparency, you guys are so friggin' smart. And Julian, who you guys work with all the time on our team, is so friggin' smart. Like, when you guys start talking about what you're building, you're like, th there is a point, and it's early on, where you lose me. I'm like, wow, man, these dudes, like, I'm like, guys, this sounds amazing. I'm not sure what, but good luck. Um, so it's, it, for me, it's super inspiring to be around just super smart men and women. Um, and, and so, and of course, you know, we've made 13 investments so far, you guys being one of them, um, just closed a transaction with Hammerhead. So two exits after PowerDot and now Hammerhead. Um, it, the, I, almost all of them get me excited, right? I mean, the, the and again, just trying to keep up with you guys and, and Julian as you spin through this stuff, that's inspiring to me. Um, obviously an investment, a bit of a moonshot, but in, in Humane, which is setting out to sort of recreate this relationship between a human and, and this thing. Um, Robin Thurston at Outside, I think he's a fantastic entrepreneur just just kind of a serial entrepreneur. What he's building it outside is, is incredible. Even Kinetics, I really geek out on what Kinetics has built. You know, I'd love to see that thing come to fruition and, 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 and it, obviously for you guys as well. Um, I think the foot is a really important part of, of, of this whole story and, and us as athletes, and not even just as athletes. If you're a, a delivery driver for UPS, you know, the, the, that touch point is, is really critical. Um, so it, it, it's, it's uh, the thing I, I, I've seen as we've sort of gotten down the road here of the fund and deployed capital, a couple of things. One, um, I, I think COVID actually accelerated people's interest in this space. I think it, I think it forced people to, to step back and say, wait a minute, am I, not even optimized, but am I healthy? Am I making the best choices? Am I, you know, is, 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 is the end near? And so I think in a, in a weird way, that was good for us all. I also think that, that young people today care more about health and wellness and longevity and optimization and performance on the physical and mental side more than any other generation. And so it's, it's just been cool to see um, opportunities, right? And, and we've talked a lot about what it was like 30 years ago. Imagine being having this fund or having Next Ventures 30 years ago. What would you possibly have invested in? Not many choices. So it, it's, uh, and obviously it goes without saying, Aura has built an incredible platform and brand and, and, and an incredible business. So, um, Lance, you know, I think, you, you sorry, go ahead. When you think about the future, so I'm, I'm sure there will be a lot of uh, uh, tech entrepreneurs uh, listening to this podcast. And uh, is there, what's the, um, and I'm sure there are a lot of them who would love to raise from you. So when you think about how the future of the fitness industry would go, what kind of solutions do you want to see there? And what are you interested in now from an investment perspective? Well, I tell you what, what, what Kiriakos just laid out, I mean, I, that, that, that got my plums tickling. I mean, like just the ability for, and, and we just sort of walked through it, but this, again, to repeat it, this democratization of, or just the access, the access to that level of call it care, call it coverage, call it whatever you want. 
you know, because I, I think most of that stuff is so just aspirational for most people, right? You, they, they watch the Super Bowl, they watch the tour, they watch, but you know, that's uh, people could believe that they have access to that. I, I think that's it. May not be the holy grail, but I think it's uh, I think it's close. Yeah, exactly. Does the direction of um... If I give an example here, the direction of uh, looking at uh, the biomarkers of an athlete while they are doing an activity and, and, the, and the people in the crowd are looking at it, do you think it's, uh, it would be interesting? So I, <laughs> um, yes, I think it would be interesting. Now, and, and, and I, t- I talk a lot about this because, you know, and I use cycling as as an example because think about it. cycling is the tour de france is three weeks long most days are four to six hours long five or six of the days are in, in the mountains those are very exciting but most of the other days they're riding through the french countryside and it's let's just be honest it's boring so as the purist would always say or the traditionalist you know no race radios no power meters you know no let's stop the innovation i said fuck that Let's, let's use that as content, exactly to your point, Kirakos. Like these days where they're just riding through the sunflowers, like how about we are seeing this stuff as content? We are listening. If you listen to a, an F1 race or a NASCAR race, you are listening to the driver speak to the crew chief and speak to the engineers. How fascinating is that? It's amazing. If you were then able to, I mean, yes, if, if we had an inside look at this dashboard, any athlete's dashboard, it would be completely fascinating. Now, here's the problem. As fast as, as fans, like the three of us sitting here as fans would like that the athletes don't like that, right? They know that if that data is, is, is published real time, then the competition is looking at that. The competition's trainers, everybody's looking at that in real time and seeing a weakness that they could exploit. I think it would be very difficult to get, you know, in cycling to get any of that stuff done. I, ju- I just don't think, I think they, I think, and, and I think they're too insecure about it. And I think they should be. I mean, if, if, if I was racing today and somebody said, look, we're going to, this is all going to be on the bottom of the TV screen while people sit at home and watch. I said, no way. It's, it's, it's too, uh, it's too privileged, but as a fan, it'd be kind of cool. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, if you look at uh, LeBron or the Wumbo, uh, while they're throwing like a three pointer or something, and you actually see they are very stressed from it, <laughs> you can understand them so much better. But if you are on uh, the, the, the opposite coach, you can exploit it. Of course, and you can exploit it so badly. Right? No, I think I, I think it would. I, I, I don't think that will ever happen, but I, I, it's kind of a fun thing to think about or talk about. Hmm. I think the, 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 I've seen from the whoop guys posting in, uh, they had that ability to post in, uh, in Instagram, the, the heart rate of, uh, of athletes and all that. And, um, we well, see it I when, and, you know, they sponsor a lot of golfers. So they, sh- they're showing, and here's golf, right? Not, not cycling, not a marathon, not even tennis or the NBA. I mean, it's golf. They are walking and hitting a white ball. By the way, I love golf. I'm not knocking it, but um, mm-hmm. they're publishing real time heart rate numbers for, for these guys. You'd be surprised. You know, there's it's standing on a par three. And of course, a lot of them are, are sponsored by whoop, but they're standing on a par three. That's all over water. It's a 190 yard carry, you know, the difference between second place and, in fifth place is $750,000 to see their real time heart rates playing golf. I mean, that's stress. It's, it's, it's like, I, I got to give it to them. It's fascinating. It's it, um, I'm even thinking now, like, uh, even, even we think having like Federer that you think, think that he's so calm during the most stressful moments. If you actually see that he's very stressed, right. you have a very different opinion about it. Right. <laughs> he does appear calm as always. Yeah. Lance, actually what, uh, what got you into investments in the first place? Really just going back. I mean, I've, I've been at it for 30 years. I, I started dabbling 
either in, in direct investments or through funds or to the public markets, really from the first minute I started making any money, which is goes back 30 plus years. So um, always um, uh, fascinated by that. Um, and then, uh, it, you know, in a, in a and not not even in a in a in a true sense of the word. It, to me, it's a competition. When I think about what we're building at Next Ventures, uh, obviously we we want to be good stewards of other people's money, but we, we you know we want to look around the competition in the field and see how we did relative to the other funds. And so it, it's I, most things in my life have a scoreboard. This one does for sure. And then in the beginning, um, did you have, I, I listen to many investors, uh, whenever we speak with them, uh, they always say that the, ver the very first uh, investments they made, uh, they were very wrong uh, in their predictions, whereas they get it a bit better when it comes to uh, after they invest uh, a, num a number of times. Did you have something similar? Was it uh, that you did investments that you thought they, they would be great and then they ended up uh, not being so? Not so much on the direct investing side. I've been, uh, and maybe I've just been really lucky. Um, and, and, and even the way I look at, or the way I approach investing is, is really people first. I mean, I, I lean hard on, you know, just like, um, I mean, frankly and candidly, but, you know, talking to you guys, you know, you guys lose me when, when we start talking about the true depths of, of what you're building, right? But that doesn't stop me from, and of course we've all communicated over Zoom, but that doesn't stop me from just looking through the screen and, and just trying to make a call on a person. So whether, you know, direct investments in the past or even through funds, you're betting on people, right? And so I, I've always, uh, now, you don't always make the right bet. And, and by the way, that what's, what's even worse is, is the ones you pass on that you say, eh, and all of a sudden that ends up being an amazing person. Think about all the, all the people that passed on the Steve Jobses and the Sergeys of the world and the, and the, and the Zuckerbergs. And I mean, they're kicking themselves. So it, but, but I think the main takeaway for me is just, is just really believing in the team. Exactly. Especially when, when it's a, a very early stage, when you have nothing proven, you have no models, you have no financial statements, you have nothing. So the only people, the only thing you can bet on is, uh, is the team, right? Which is what, what I think YC does really well is picking the right, uh, people to build businesses. Right. Yeah. Yeah. This yeah, is the exactly. usual, uh, Paul Graham's, uh, advice, uh, which is usually invest in the people, not the idea. And to be very honest, uh, from our experience in, in Europe versus the US, that's exactly the difference we've seen. The, the people in the US are looking to invest, and the, the best, I would say the, the best investors in the world are usually looking to invest in people, whereas in Europe, it's much more about the ideas. Yeah. I saw there was a, he's been wildly successful um, <clears throat> venture capitalist named Brad Feld, actually based here in Colorado, started the foundry group uh, down in Boulder, but uh, I went to a speech he gave once and, and he was talking about their investment, sort of their investment approach. And he said, they have four criteria and they never deviate. Number one, the people. Number two, the people. Number three, the people. Number four, the idea. And I, and I, it was, it was one of the most important things. I mean, I think I always knew that I had to make a call on a person, but to hear it from somebody that's, that's been so successful. Um, I mean, I it, it, what, talk about a light bulb moment. Exactly. That's the whole point. Even, even when it comes to the idea, even they, when they start with the wrong idea, it's, uh, good founders by definition would know when a bad idea is bad and they will turn it into a good idea. So the starting point is not a determination of the future, uh, life of the startup. Right. It's just a way to start. So I think from a, from a betting perspective, you have nothing to bet on apart from people. Right. So that's, that's spot on. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. 
Awesome. Lance, uh, to close this, um, I wanted to take your thoughts on if we just go 10 years in the future, what, uh, what, does cycling, uh, what is cycling going to look like? Ooh. What, what is it going to look like or what would I like for it to look like? Uh, maybe in both. <laughs> uh, I, I, I think the sport needs, um, and, I, and I speak about this all the time on my shows, but um, I, I think the sport should not, it, it, it should not be modeled or it should not be, it's, its aspiration should not be to be an Olympic sport. Its aspiration should be to become a major professional sport, right? So whether it's Formula One, tennis, of course, a lot of these sports are Olympic sports, but that is not their goal. Their goal is to be the most successful, profitable, professional sport. So NFL here in the USA, obviously incredible success story. Formula One, we've seen what has happened with a with reimagining of Formula One the last three years since Liberty bought it. Um, cycling should adopt that model, right? It, you, you should not be beholden to the IOC or the USOC or any Olympic committee. You should be out trying to build the next premiership. And, and with that, you know, obviously, you know, athletes should be, have a better representation. Cycling right now, there's no representation. Um, I, I think, I, I do think in 10 years time, cycle, back up a second. Cycling is, is about one event, right? The Tour de France is 99% of the sport. I know people don't like to hear that. I may be a little off on the numbers. I'm not much off. So I think in 10 years' time, and of course it's been owned by the same family forever, I think in 10 years' time it will be owned by somebody else, and they will not be French. So with that comes a new set of eyes, a new, a new and ears and, and perspectives that will, that will hopefully look to evolve and grow and professionalize the, the sport of cycling. I, I mean, I could talk on this for hours. Um, and, and I think... Although the number will be big, I think it will be bought for us. I think it'll be a steal. If you truly optimized that event, which optimizes the sport, you could, because you buy one event, you buy the whole sport. I think that happens. I think if we have this conversation in 10 years, it's, it's in different hands. And I think that's probably in its best interest. Yeah, the fact that it's, it's it's not going to be French, it means that you will have a very bright future. Look at all look at all of the money going into to 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 sports. Okay, we're we're talking about you know investing in certain segments and sectors of the, of sport, but the amount of private equity going in just to buy you know they're going in and buying half of a Division C team in Holland. Like this is like. There is so much money because sport is is never ever going away, and 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 these old systems can be optimized and made into huge empires. And so, um, there were they they uh, there is a ton of interest in in buying the Tour de France, just because, like I said, you buy the tour, you buy the sport. Um, but the reality is, the family has all has never even entertained an offer, never even sat down to have a a conversation so for the time being it is where it is fantastic lance it's been a pleasure as always thank you let's get together but you guys were just in san francisco and i missed you guys by a couple of days but you get back over this way let's uh let's get we together have, we have to organize a proper event where we invite you invite you lance and you uh, you join us Love what's it. The best, what's the best location to meet you? We can come. If you if you join San Francisco, we can be there. Yeah, San Francisco. We we got the team. We, we're out there. You know, we're starting to I move. I met the team, actually. I went yeah. to the office. Yeah, uh, so we're, we're moving around. Yeah. Next month, we're doing South Florida for our get-together. But it's normally San Fran. So let's meet there. Ralph, will you and me can uh, go swim Masters down at Stanford. Yeah. It's, this, it's the best swimming experience I've ever had. It's incredible. That's, that's the mecca of swimming. Pools, 
multiple pools, great athletes, great coaches, outdoors. You can come over there and kick my ass. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do it. All right. Thanks, guys. Fantastic. Okay. Thanks so much, Lance. Yeah. Yeah. Y'all have a great day.